everyone loves the idea of a high yielding dividend portfolio. A portfolio that pays out huge dividend payments on a monthly or quarterly basis. But the unfortunate reality is that most people building a high yield dividend portfolio make some massive mistakes and this leads to things like dividend cuts and negative share price growth which can be financially devastating. So in this video, we're going to be covering key concepts like who should consider a high yield portfolio, the pros and cons of high yield investing, and most importantly, building a sample portfolio of high yield stocks that meet our specific criteria. So let's go ahead and jump in. Now where there are definitely plenty of different styles of dividend investing, the two most popular are going to be dividend growth and high yield investing. And for myself, I consider myself a dividend growth investor, but you need to analyze what your goals are to decide which one you are. And to do that, you need to understand the key differences between dividend growth and high yield investing. Now if we go ahead and jump over and look at this chart I built out. It's going to give us a general idea of the main differences between dividend growth investing and high yield investing. And what we're looking at is an example of the monthly dividend payouts we could receive if we had a lump sum investment into dividend growth stocks versus high yield stocks. Now we can see blue is going to be high yield and red is going to be dividend growth. And the main takeaway here is we can see high yielding dividend stocks provide the most immediate dividend income and typically it'll do so for quite some time. But the thing with dividend growth stocks is they increase their dividend payouts yearly at a pretty high rate. And so as a result, we can see the dividend payments you receive over the long term continue to grow at a very high rate. So over the long term, dividend growth investing typically provides more in dividend income, but in the immediate short term, high yield investing can provide far more dividend income. So you have to ask yourself, are you seeking out immediate high levels of dividend income? Because if you're trying to maximize dividend income over the long run, you want to go with the dividend growth route like I am. But if you're looking for immediate dividend income, then you want to explore high yielding options. Now again, when we look at the key differences versus dividend growth and high yield, it's pretty self-explanatory for the most part. If we break down this a little bit more, we can see some more key differences between dividend growth and high yield investments. And the first is going to be leverage. High yield stocks are typically going to have higher debt levels. Now if you're wise, you'll probably avoid the ones that have unhealthy debt levels, but for the most part, typically high yielding investments do have higher debt levels. Now payout ratio is going to be another key one, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later in the video. But dividend growth stocks typically have lower payout ratios. What does this mean? Well, a company generates free cash flow, and with that free cash flow, companies can do five different things. They can reinvest back into the business, pay down debt, buy back shares, pay out dividends, or they can attempt mergers and acquisitions. Dividend growth stocks typically have low payout ratios because they don't use all of their free cash flow to pay out dividends. They use a lot of it to reinvest back into the business, which in turn allows them to pay out more in dividends the next year. But on the alternative, high holding stocks use the majority of their free cash flow typically to pay out dividends. So that's a pretty key difference right there. Now the next difference goes hand in hand with this, free cash flow growth. Dividend growers grow their free cash flow because they reinvest so heavily back into the business, while high yield stocks typically don't grow free cash flow at such a high rate because they're using most of their free cash flow to pay out dividends. So as a result of this, the risk of a dividend cut is going to be much higher for higher yielding investments, which is why you have to be so careful when selecting high yield dividend stocks. You have to really analyze the company and make sure you understand them. And then finally, total return for dividend growth stocks is typically going to be much higher. You're going to see more share price appreciation and over the very long term, more dividend payments. Now with high older stocks, you're not going to see much share price appreciation, but yes, you will get more immediate dividend income. Let's look at one quick example of a high yielding stock versus a dividend growth stock. Let's start with a high yielding stock. If we come over here and plug in VZ and hit enter, all this data will automatically load into my spreadsheet thanks to the help of the ticker data add-on in Google Sheets. And if you want to be able to automatically pull in stock financial straight into your spreadsheet and be able to use any of the spreadsheets you see in this video, then you can head over to tickerdata.com at the link in the description. But here's what we can see with Verizon. This is a high yielding stock. It has a 6.18% starting dividend yield, but the dividend growth has been very slow because they use most of their free cash flow to pay out dividends. We can see a payout ratio of 94.93% and a free cash flow payout ratio of close to 59%. So for example, if we come over here, we can see in 2023, they generated around 18.7 billion in free cash flow, but they used about 11 billion of that to pay out dividends. So the majority of their free cash flow is being used to pay out dividends. Now let's compare this to a dividend growth stock. For example, let's look at Visa stock. I'll plug in stock ticker V. Now this will again load in and we can see the starting dividend yield is very low. It's sitting at just 0.72%, but the payout ratio is 21% and the free cash flow payout ratio 19%. So they're using the majority of their capital to reinvest back into the business. And as a result, we can see their yearly dividend payments are growing at a high rate every single year. They started at about 35 cents in 2013 and by 2023 they're at $1.87 and right now 
$2.08. And again, because they're heavily reinvesting back into the business, we can see the free cash flow for this business has also been growing at a very rapid rate, going from around $2.5 billion in 2013 to in 2023, almost $20 billion. And in 2023, they only used about $3.75 billion to pay out dividends. So again, this is a great dividend growth stock. So obviously, you have to be careful when building your high yield portfolio. There's key things you want to look for, and let's talk about some of that criteria. We're going to go ahead and list off a few of the things we're looking for in the example portfolio of stocks that we're about to list out. Now we can see we're looking for a dividend yield of at least 5% and ideally higher. We don't want the dividend payments to have large fluctuations, and this is an important one. I'm going to talk about it in just a moment. We need sufficient dividend coverage. We want to make sure those dividends will be able to continue to be paid moving forward. We want to look for a healthy balance sheet. We want to make sure the earnings and free cash flow of the company is not declining. And of course, we don't want the share price to plummet when we buy the stock. So this is some key criteria we want to look for. Now, this one's easy. Obviously, we just look for stocks with a starting yield above that. But this is where things start to get tricky. Dividend payments don't have large fluctuations. And I think this is where a lot of people start to make mistakes. For example, let's look at a very popular high yielding dividend ETF, JEPI, J-E-P-I, the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF. Now to start off, I'm not necessarily saying this is a bad ETF. I think for some people it could hold a place in their portfolio. Now to start off, we can see the starting dividend yield is sitting at about 7.06%. But as for me, if I was currently building a high yield portfolio, I'd want stable and predictable dividend payments that don't fluctuate at a high rate. So if we jump over to dividends right here, click on the dividend history for this company, we can see these dividend payments actually fluctuate by a pretty large amount. And for example, if we look right here, we can see one of the largest dividend payments they ever paid out was around 62 cents, but one of the lowest was around 26 cents. So we can see that their lowest dividend payment was more than 50% lower than their highest dividend payment of all time. So these dividend payments can fluctuate at a really high rate. So if you're someone looking to live off these dividend payments, it makes it really difficult when you don't know what to expect every single month. You have no idea how much they're gonna pay you out. Let's look at another popular dividend ETF. We have JEPQ, J-E-P-Q, the JP Morgan NASDAQ, Equity Premium Income ETF. Another very high starting dividend yield. It's sitting at 9.5%, but again, if we look at the dividend history for this fund, we can see again those payments fluctuate at a pretty high rate. For example, in October of 2022, they paid out around 38 cents per share, and just one month later, it was around 68 cents per share. Again, that's a massive difference between just two months. So if you're someone just looking to add some supplemental income, yes, maybe a covered call ETF could be a good option. But if you're someone who's relying on these dividend payments and you need them to be predictable and reliable, you might want to stay away from covered call ETFs. And again, there are plenty of covered call ETFs or ETFs that use a derivative style to generate income. And I found quite a few and I listed them all out here. And you can pause the video and look at them and look at the description for them if you want. But again, I would warn you to be careful with these funds. And for example, there's even ETFs that'll pay you out on a weekly basis. Let's look at one of them. We have XDTE, the Roundhill S&P 500 Covered Call Strategy ETF. And again, they pay out on a weekly basis. So if we come down here, we can see a payout on June 12th, June 19th, June 26th. So, and this gets a lot of people excited, but first off, it's important to remember, yes, weekly dividends or monthly dividends, they're great. Who wouldn't want that? But in reality, it doesn't make the fund any better. And again, they struggle with the same problem. The dividend payments aren't very predictable, they aren't reliable, and they can fluctuate at a very high rate. Look at this, they had one month where the dividend payment was just two cents, and about four or five months later, it was as high as around 34 cents or even 37 cents. So again, be careful with these funds. Now our next criteria is sufficient dividend coverage, and this can look different depending on the type of business that we're looking at. For example, we already talked about how the free cash flow should be covering the dividend payments. So for a company like Verizon, we can see their free cash flow in 2023 was covering those dividend payments, so at the surface level, it looks like that dividend payment is safe. But depending on the business we're looking at, this can look very different. And we're gonna see this throughout the video. For example, it's gonna be a little bit different if we're looking at a real estate investment trust or if we're looking at a business development company. And we'll talk about how to analyze that in this video. So we need a healthy balance sheet. And then of course, ideally, we wanna make sure that free cash flow or earnings is not declining because if it is, eventually it's gonna to lead to insufficient dividend coverage and they won't be able to continue paying that dividend out anymore. Now, finally, we have share price will hold steady or go up. And unfortunately, some people will completely ignore this in favor of big dividend payments but that can be a huge mistake. For example, there are now plenty of yield max ETFs out there now, and their only goal is paying out as much in dividends as possible, but we can see over the past year, they're down an astounding 58%.
So let's go ahead and start building out our example portfolio and see if we can find some companies that meet this criteria. We're going to be looking at companies that are more typical. We'll be looking at REITs. We'll be looking at business development companies and even a fund or two. So let's go ahead and get started and plug in stock ticker MO. Now, in order for all this data to automatically load into my spreadsheet, again, we'll be using the ticker data function. So for example, if we want to automatically pull in the dividend yield, we can just use the ticker data live function, select MO, and then come over here and select dividend yield and hit enter. And you can see this will automatically load in. So if we do the same for these other categories, we can start to get some good insights into Altria. And the first thing we can see is this is a big dividend payer at 8.2%. If we go ahead and jump over to our dividend breakdown sheet, come up here and plug in MO. And here's what we can see about the company. Yes, high starting dividend yield and the payout ratios are a little bit on the high side, but they've actually done a pretty good job of increasing those dividend payouts over time as well. We can see a five year dividend CAGR of about 4.46%. So in reality, you kind of get the best of both worlds. And when we talk about the sufficiency of their dividend, we can see free cash flow has been covering those dividend payments since 2018. And if you look at the payout ratio, it stayed in a decent range. In 2018, it's about 66%. And since then, it's been sitting close to around 80% for the past five years. Now, what's interesting about this is if we look at the reports from the management team, they're actually targeting an 80% payout ratio. So this high payout ratio isn't a result of poor management. This is actually exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to reward their shareholders in the form of dividend payments. And then if we look at Altria over the past year, they're actually up by about 15%. So people who've been holding this stock over the past year or so are probably pretty happy with their investment. And if we jump over to my stock screener and plug in stock ticker MO, and one of the things I wanna point out is if we look at ROIC, this stands for return on invested capital. How profitable are the projects the company is putting their capital into? We can see in 2023, it was 39.27%. And for reference, typically you wanna see this be at least 10%. So this company has done a pretty good job of getting good returns with the capital that they are investing back into the business. Now remember, it's limited capital because they use most of it to pay out dividends, but the capital they are reinvesting back into the business has been really doing well for the company. That's a good sign. Now the next company on our list is actually gonna be one we just glanced at, and that's gonna be Verizon Communications. And we can see they have a starting dividend yield sitting at about 6.18%. If we go ahead and jump back over to our, to our dividend breakdown sheet, and like I already pointed out, the starting dividend yield is high, but again, the dividend payment growth is pretty slow, but it has been growing slightly over time. The five-year and 10-year dividend CAGR are both close to around 2.3 to 2.4%. I don't think that quite keeps up with inflation, but overall, they are increasing it a little bit, which is a nice little boost to your dividend yield on cost over time. And like we saw, for the most part, free cash flow has been covering those dividend payments, with the exception of 2022, when it was very close. Free cash flow was around 10.4 billion, while dividends paid out was about 10.8 billion. And if we look at the past year for Verizon, they've actually done really well as well. They're up about 39%. Now that's definitely not gonna be typical for Verizon. They definitely had a bounce back year, but again, that's a large jump. If we jump over to our stock screener for Verizon and plug in VZ, now what we can see with Verizon is revenue per share hasn't changed too much over the past decade. It's been sitting at about $31 to $32 per share. But on the other side of this, free cash flow has actually grown quite a bit over the past five to six years compared to where they were in 2014 through 2016. And if we jump over to my profitability and income statement sheet, one of the things we can see is they actually have a pretty good gross profit ratio. The 10-year average is at about 59.04%, and in 2023, it was 59.03%. So the gross profit ratio has been pretty steady over the past decade. Now the next stocks on our list are where things are going to start to get a little more interesting. For example, the first stock we're gonna add after these two is gonna be EPD. This is an energy stock, an oil stock, and we can see it has a pretty high starting dividend yield, sitting at about 7.21%. And if we jump over to the dividend breakdown sheet and come up here and plug in EPD, and like I said, yes, high starting dividend yield, and we can actually see those dividend payments are growing over time. So we're getting consistent and growing dividends. So that's a huge bonus. But the problem a lot of people have is when they look at the free cash flow versus dividends paid, a lot of the times the dividends paid is actually higher than the free cash flow. Now, why is this? Well, one of the things you have to understand when you're looking at utility companies or energy companies, they have very high levels of capital expenditures, which lowers free cash flow. So the free cash flow payout ratio typically isn't gonna be the best way to judge the safety of the dividend payment for an oil energy company. Typically, we wanna look at the earnings payout ratio, which is different from how I typically analyze companies. So it's important you have an understanding of what type of company you're looking at. If we go over to my stock screener and plug in EPD, what we can see is the earnings growth over the past decade looks relatively healthy, which should give you confidence that they're gonna be able to continue to maintain that high dividend yield and maybe even continue to grow that dividend. Look at the five-year dividend CAGR, about 3.65% and the 10-year close to about 4% pretty impressive for a company with a pretty high starting dividend yield. And if we look at this company over the past year, it looks like it's up around 5.28%. 
and over the past five years up about 6.43%. And while we're looking at energy companies, let's go ahead and plug in our next one, MPLX. Like you would suspect, another company with a high starting dividend yield. This one's even higher, sitting at about 7.67%. So if we jump over to our dividend breakdown sheet and plug in MPLX, and again, we have to remember, this is an energy oil company. So we wanna focus more on that payout ratio, which is high, but it does look sustainable. And they've actually been maintaining pretty high dividend payments for quite some time now, and even growing that dividend at a pretty healthy rate over the past five and 10 years. And if we look at Seeking Alpha, the past year has been really good for this company as well, currently up around 22.06%. So now on our list, we have a couple of traditional stocks combined with some energy oil stocks. But let's start to explore some of our options for real estate investment trust. And the first one on here that I'm going to list is going to be EPR. And this is a REIT that pays out dividends on a monthly basis. Now, one of the things I do want to point out is if we look at the beta for this company, remember, this is a measure of the volatility in comparison to the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 has a beta of one. So if a company's beta is above that, they're more volatile. And if it's below, they're less volatile than the S&P 500. Well, EPR has a beta of 1.76, so it is gonna have more volatility than most companies in this portfolio. But again, we can see a high starting dividend yield. Now, one of the things we'll see is a payout ratio that looks pretty high, so let's explore this. If we jump over to our dividend breakdown sheet again and plug in EPR, and what we can see is a high starting dividend yield, sitting at 7%, but we actually have quite a bit we need to break down here. Now, first off, payout ratio is sitting at 157%, so what is going on there? Well, we have to understand Payout ratio is not the best way to judge the safety of a REIT's dividend payment because they are required by law to pay out 90% of their earnings in the form of dividends. So how can we better analyze them? Well, we need to be looking at the AFFO payout ratio. So if we go over to Seeking Alpha and click on dividends and click on dividend safety and scroll down, we can see the AFFO payout ratio it looks like right here. And remember, this stands for adjusted funds from operation. This is a key metric for real estate investment trust. And for the trailing 12 months, it's sitting at about 68% and for and forward looking, it's at about 71%. So those dividend payments do look healthy. Now it's important you understand what type of REIT EPR is. Their tenants are what they would call experiential real estate. They invest in real estate that provides experience for users. For example, think of places like Topgolf or even ski resorts. So the upside of this is this market is expected to explode, but on the downside of this, they are very susceptible to the shutdowns in 2020, and we can see that with the dividend history of the company. We get a more detailed look. Yes, like I mentioned, they pay out dividends on a monthly basis, but we can see due to 2020, they cut that dividend entirely and then brought it back in 2021. Now, since then, they've been paying them out consistently on a monthly basis and have even been increasing those dividend payouts like they used to, but it's still not quite as high as it was pre-2020. Now, I think it's pretty unlikely we'll see another event occur like we saw in 2020 that would completely shut down all of their real estate, but that is a risk to be aware of. And now the next REIT is probably one you're aware of if you've watched the channel before, and that's going to be Vici Property, stock ticker VICI, Las Vegas Real Estate. Now, this is one of the lower yielders on our list. It comes in at about 5.23%, but I like this REIT for a lot of different reasons, and I even own it in my personal portfolio. Now, this REIT hasn't been publicly traded for a long time, as we can see with the history right here, but the starting dividend yield is pretty good at 5.23%. But since they haven't publicly traded, they've increased the dividends at a pretty high rate, which is a phenomenal sign. The five-year dividend CAGR comes in at about 8.14%. Now, one of the things you have to be aware of a lot of the times when it comes to real estate investment trusts is if we jump over to the stock screener and come up here and plug in Vici, is if we come down here and look at shares outstanding, we can see shares outstanding over the past decade, and especially in the past two or three years, have grown at a really high rate. Now, the reason behind this is we have to remember REITs are required by law to pay out 90% of their earnings in the form of dividends, like I mentioned earlier. So this means in order for them to grow, they really have two options. They can either take out debt or they can issue new shares. Now, for the majority of the last decade, we had a low interest rate environment. And when that was the case, it looks like Vici was electing to use debt because they weren't really issuing any new shares. But because rates have been quite a bit higher over the past couple of years, we can see it looks like they've decided to issue new shares. So you have been diluted a little bit over the past few years, but this is pretty standard for REITs. Again, something to be aware of though. Now over the past year, Vici is up around 13%. And for me, Vici is the ideal REIT for a lot of different reasons. It can fit into a dividend growth portfolio or a portfolio more oriented towards dividend yield. Not to mention, I think over the long term, you'll see some good share price appreciation as well. And they also own some of the most iconic real estate out there. Some of the most iconic places in Las Vegas. You can't replicate that. So now we have some real estate in our portfolio. We have some energy stocks and then our more typical high yielders. 
But what I want to explore now is something I haven't talked about on the channel much before, and that is business development companies. Now, what business development companies or BDCs typically do is they'll invest in private companies, providing them with debt or equity financing. And so one of the places you can explore BDCs is with Raymond James Weekly Insight on BDCs. I'll put a link to this in the description, but if we scroll down, we can see they're going to give us a list of a ton of BDCs and how they performed over the past week, over the past year, and they're going to provide a ton of helpful insights as well. But there's a couple of different things that we personally want to focus on in order to see if these dividend payments are safe because most of them pay out very high dividends. Now, if we come up here, the first thing we want to look at is going to be right here, the weighted average yield. What does this mean? Well, the weighted average yield of a BDC is going to refer to the average yield of its investment portfolio weighted by the proportion of each asset in that portfolio. So basically, this is the yield they're getting on all those debt and financing deals that we just talked about. Now, the first thing we typically see as investors is how much they're paying out in dividends. But again, we have to judge how safe those dividend payments are. So if we start to scroll up here, we can see right here, total dividend yield. We have the starting dividend yield for all these different BDC companies. And they're definitely all on the high side. We can see there's even one with an 18.8% dividend yield. But to be honest, I doubt that dividend yield is very safe. We want to find the BDCs with high yields that also have sustainable dividend payments. So here's one of the ways we can judge the safety of a BDC dividend. We can look at the difference between the weighted average yield that the company is getting versus its starting dividend yield that they currently have. We want the weighted yield to be higher than the total dividend yield. So let's go ahead and look at an example. If we come down here and look at the weighted average yield, let's pick out a company. Let's say we want to look at Blue Owl Capital Corporation right here. We can see the weighted average yield for this company and their assets is coming in at about 12%. Let's compare this to the starting dividend yield for the company that we'd be getting as investors. We can see right here, Blue Owl Capital Corporation coming in at about 11.5%. So the yield that they're getting from their assets can sustain the high dividend yield for this company. That's exactly what we're looking for. Again, I'll put a link to this PDF in the description. But after analyzing all these companies and looking at the total dividend yield versus the weighted average yield, along with things like debt to equity ratios, I picked out the three BDCs that I felt like had the most sustainable and had the safest dividend payments. And let's go ahead and add them to our portfolio. I'll paste them in right here and we'll go ahead and drag down these formulas with the ticker data functions. And we can see the BDCs that we're looking at are going to be main M-A-I-N. We have O-B-D-C, which is actually what we just saw. And then we have GLAD, G-L-A-D. Let's go ahead and break down each of these. If we jump over to Seeking Alpha, the first one we'll look at is going to be Main Street Capital. This is one of the more popular BDCs, and they've had a very, very good year. Trading at $52, they're up almost 30% in the past year alone. And if we look at the starting dividend yield for this company, it's sitting at about 7.94%. Now, if we look at the dividend history, there's something we do need to point out. We can see this company's pretty good about making dividend payments on a monthly basis, which obviously gets a lot of investors excited. But over the past year, they've actually paid out quite a few special dividends. For example, you can see right here, a special dividend was paid in March. We can see a special dividend paid right here in June and another special dividend paid right here in September. So on top of the monthly dividend payments they've been making lately, they've also made some special dividend payments on a quarterly basis. So this BDC has really been rewarding shareholders over the past year. And keep in mind, just like REITs, BDCs are required by law to pay out 90% of their earnings in the form of dividends. Now again, keep in mind, in my opinion, BDCs are typically a little more on the riskier side, but I did try to pick out the least risky BDCs I could find on that list. Now our next one is going to be OBDC. And we can see here on Seeking Alpha, that's Blue Owl Capital Corporation trading at $15.13. And over the past year, they're up around 9.88%. Now this is a huge dividend yielder. We can see it's coming in at about 11.56%. But like we just saw on the PDF, we could see that their weighted average yield was sufficiently covering the total dividend yield. So it looks like those dividend payments are sustainable. And to back this up, let's look at the company's dividend history. This is a great place to start. If we go ahead and zoom out, we can see for the most part, it looks like at least since 2021, they've consistently paid out dividends and have even grown them along with a few special dividends along the way. Another good sign. So if you're looking to be a little more aggressive with a company that has a very high starting dividend yield, maybe this is one to explore. And then the last BDC we're going to look at is going to be GLAD, stock ticker GLAD. We can see over the past year, this is another company that's done really well, up around 26.77%. We can see the starting dividend yield sitting close to 8%. Let's go ahead and check out the sustainability of that dividend payment once again. If we scroll down, we need to find GLAD. If we look right here, we can see Gladstone Investment Corporation with a weighted average yield of about 14.5%. 
So let's compare that to the total dividend yield. We come down here, we can see Gladstone Capital Corporation again, coming in at an 8.1% total dividend yield. And like we just saw, that starting dividend yield is now down to around 8%. So it looks like they can easily cover that dividend as of right now. Now, like always, we should look at the dividend history to go ahead and back this up. And it looks like that is true. If we zoom out and look at the past 10 years, it's actually pretty impressive for a business development company. Like most companies during 2020, they had a slight reduction, but since then, they've done a great job of paying out those dividends on a monthly basis and increasing them over the past few years. So when it comes to business development companies, I would definitely warn you to be very careful. Make sure you understand the underlying business and how they work and how to judge the safety of those dividend payments because there are tons of BDCs that can really hurt you. For example, if we just looked at this list and took the company that has the highest starting total dividend yield, looks like InvestCorp Credit Management BDC, and look at them on Seeking Alpha, we can see over the past year, they're down about 14.56%, and if we look at the dividend history for this company, it's actually pretty ugly. The dividends declined quite a few times, and they've even had some months where they haven't paid out anything in dividends. For our last stock, it's actually not going to be a stock. Let's finally look at a fund. We've seen companies that are more typical. We have energy companies, we have real estate companies, and we have financial services or BDCs. Well, let's go ahead and add a fund to this example portfolio. And that fund is gonna be UTG. We can see it has a somewhat low beta and a pretty nice starting dividend yield sitting at about 7%. And they've also been growing that dividend slightly over the past few years. If we go ahead and jump over to Seeking Alpha, let's come up here and plug in UTG. And what we can see is this is actually a utility fund. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we go ahead and jump over to holdings, we can see the holdings by breakdown. About 59% of the holdings in this fund are utility stocks. These are stocks that are known to pay out big dividend payments, but they also have stocks in communication, real estate, energy, and industrials. And if we go back over to our summary tab, we can see over the past year, they're up close to 31%. So they've done really well. Now, one thing I do have to point out, and this is a huge problem with this fund, is they have a very high expense ratio. It's coming in at 2.23%. So that is the biggest red flag for this fund that I do wanna point out. But what I do like about them is if we look at the dividend history, we can see a very, very steady history of paying out consistent dividends on a monthly basis. It's pretty rare you can see a chart that looks this good. And along with those dividend payments, we can even see along the way, there have been some special dividends paid as well. Now, if you want something like this utility trust with not as high of an expense ratio, one of the things you can explore is VPU. And this is the Vanguard Utilities Index Fund. And Vanguard typically has pretty low expense ratios. For example, we can see the expense ratio on this one is just 0.1%. Over the past year, it's up quite a bit, about 36% but the starting dividend yield is considerably lower than the fund we just looked at. It's sitting at about 2.8%. If we look at the dividend history for this one, it's not quite as good, but overall still pretty solid. So here you go. Here are some example stocks you could use to start building out a very high yield dividend portfolio. Hopefully you have a better understanding of whether or not you should be pursuing a high yield portfolio and the pros and cons, and also how to better analyze the safety and sustainability of high yielding investments. Each of these categories have a different way of really analyzing and understanding how sustainable those dividend payments truly are. And like always, if you'd like to be able to use any of the spreadsheets that you saw in this video and also get access to the ticker data add on in Google Sheets that allows you to automatically import stock financial straight into your spreadsheet, then you can head over to tickerdata.com at the link in the description. So with all that being said, thank you guys so much for watching and please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel.